Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to The Right Time, a Wave Sports and Entertainment original presented by Prize Picks. My name is Bomani Jones. Thanks for listening wherever you get your podcast. Thanks for watching us on YouTube. Subscribe, like, rate us, review us, give us five stars. You only give us four stars. I'm inclined to believe you are a hater. And by the way, I want to throw this out here just right fast. I hadn't really thought about it till right now, but I do feel like this is an important detail. That is my Emmy, just so y'all know. Like, like it's legit. There ain't nobody coming in here taking my shit. You know what I'm saying? Y'all might have heard, but, uh, you know. It belonged to me. Anyway, um, I just have a question to ask everybody. I know it's the thing that y'all really want to talk about uh, coming in here. It's really the only thing on anybody's minds. And I just want to ask y'all, how about them Lions? I told y'all about the Lions. I've been, t- I've been talking about the Lions even since, we before, even since before we came over to Wave Sports and Entertainment. I don't think y'all seem to get it, do you? It's a distinct possibility that the Lions are going to the NFC Championship game. They get to play the winner of the uh, bowl of the Eagles and the Buccaneers, right? So whoever wins that game, they're going to have to go play a game in Detroit. I think Detroit go handle that, and then they might go to the NFC Championship game since the, for the first time since I was in the seventh grade. And I just want to point this out, though, about that. The last time they did that, I want to say they lost that game like 30 to 7. But they were playing against quite literally the best football team I've ever seen. Anyway, they go to the Lions. They go to the Lions. Sean, we got that. Did we get a chance to get a look at uh, the, all the Detroit dignitaries that showed up? Detroit seems so happy to be up in that bad boy. Sean, we got that. Yeah, the chat is clearly uh, buzzing with Lions chatter. Let me get this photo ready for yes. you in a sec. Yeah, no, everybody was out there, man. Um, I, I don't mean, did they, did they get Journey to come? Like, because I know that don't stop believing. That's their jam. They should have, they, they needed to get Journey out there. Like, they, they should have been out there, even though South Detroit don't really exist. Everybody seemed to come back. They had, and there we go. Look at this, man. We got Calvin Johnson. We have uh, the ironically named Big Sean. We got Eminem, who, by the way, if he's in the same height class as Big Sean, is not nearly as tall as I thought. We got Barry Sanders and the homie Bazaar. Over there on the left, y'all may remember Bizarre. Maybe y'all don't, but they got Bizarre over there. They ain't, they ain't really give him no credit for being up in that picture. But way to go, Detroit. They, they made that. I, I don't understand how any of y'all don't root for them. They just seemed, it's a feel-good situation, man. It's a good It's a good little story. My man Vinny, he refuses to get on board. I told him before the year I could see the Lions winning a playoff game or two, and he just wouldn't buy into it. He just 100% didn't believe it, man. They burned him. Back in the day, I understand that. I don't have to get off, got off a narcotic at some point. But I'm just saying right now, Vinny, we got to do this, man. They got the homie Brad Holmes. And by the homie, I mean the homie, who's the general manager. Um, they got the homie Aaron Glenn. And by the homie, I do mean the homie. Uh, called him plays on defense. Uh, Dan Campbell. Again, this is something that uh, we Texans are going to tell y'all, man. Y'all think y'all, y'all got to misunderstand it in your head on who the white homie really is that be coming through for you. The guy that you thinking about, yeah, it's a little shaky. The guy with the water, water, uh, with the water, what you call it, dip in his mouth, might have voted for Trump. He might be a little more likely to stand with you. Just throwing it out there. My own personal experience. But anyway, y'all don't want to talk about the Lions. Y'all want to talk about the Cowboys, don't you? Y'all want to talk about the Cowboys. Cowboys got that ass whooped, boy. I was, uh, that was Sunday, that game was. It was a Sunday afternoon. It was the 4.30 game. And I don't. I am typically, unless we're talking about the Falcons, I'm not one of those people that just generally believes that just because you are a certain kind of team, that means that you can't win. And a couple reasons for that. One, I've seen the Falcons go to not one but two Super Bowls, even though in those Super Bowls, one, the night before, the NFL man of the goddamn year got caught solicited in a prostitute and it seemed to affect his performance in the game when the pass went over his head. And then the next time they had a 28 to 3 lead in the Super Bowl and I was like, they still ain't going to win and they did not win. All right. So like it's a little different when we start talking about the Falcons, maybe to a degree, the Cleveland Browns. Right. It's just kind of a you are who you are sort of situation. But I just generally don't believe in that. And so I looked at this and it was Green Bay. And it was the Cowboys. And I saw going into game. And I had to be honest with myself. And I felt like a lot of us needed to be honest with ourselves about this. Um, It's very simple. I ain't been watching them boys play no football. Sean, square up with me, man. When's the last time you watched the Packers play? 
Oh, man. Uh, honestly, no clue. I, I, I cannot remember the last time I watched, actively watched the Packers game. So the thing that happens is, and I noticed this goes on during the year, sometimes a team either gets sorry or they get really good. And so doing the kind of work that we do, you can't watch for so many games at once. So you don't really like get back over to them because their games don't necessarily be that consequential. And it looked early like the Packers wasn't making this thing happen. The Jordan Love thing, unfortunately, wasn't looking so much like a thing. And then they was just kind of like bringing up the rear in the NFC. And you know how I feel about the play. I told you I didn't care who lived or died getting into these playoffs this year. And apparently I was tripping because, Sean, while we were asleep, uh, Jordan Love became that guy. Did you yeah. know he was this good? I, I did I, not. From a fantasy perspective, from fantasy football perspective, I knew that Jordan Love in the last like six or seven games has been heating up and looking like a real QB one, but not to the point where I was like making it must watch television. Right. And that's a fantasy perspective, right? Like Kirk Cousins from a fantasy perspective had been a very good quarterback at points in which he was not actually um, a very good quarterback. You remember that year Blake Bortles was the fantasy man? You remember that one? Yeah, exactly. Do. It doesn't translate technically to on paper as it might on, yes. you know, your fantasy scores. Yeah, like especially them garbage time all-stars. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's what Blake Bortles was. They stunk. And so he threw like 35 touchdown passes that year or something crazy like that. But anyway, I'm out there watching Jordan Love. And to be fair, I mean, I imagine that it is easier to be a quarterback playing against a team that only got 10 people. Because it looked like the Cowboys only had 10 people out there, man. Like, it was dudes out there so open. Like, honestly, I don't... If I was as open as some of them cats were, like... And I don't even know these dudes' names. Because all they receivers are first- to second-year players. I know they got a dude named Romeo. I know they got a dude named Christian. And so, please forgive me when I refer to this next player as this white dude. You know what I'm talking about, right? That pass they threw to that white dude. And he was standing, like, all, all, all the way by himself, Right? Like he jumped, like he the guy that came yep, on the train yep, with a boombox playing country music. Their tight end Luke Musgraves. Sounds oh, like Luke a, Musgrave. Okay, sounds I'm like a country he's some singer. Kind of kin to, yeah, I'm assuming he's some kind of kin to Bill Musgrave, and I don't remember Bill Musgrave being fast. So this dude was just over there, just him and his lonesome standing over there, caught that pass and ran. I'm like, y'all, y'all, y'all got to only had ten people out here. Like that's how bad it looked with the Cowboys. It's like when 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 Green Bay had the ball, it looked like the Cowboys had ten people. When the Cowboys had the ball, it looked like Green Bay had twelve people. That's the only way I can understand how Dak was out here just throwing them at them balls. He was just throwing them right at them, right at them, right at them. Like uh, you, I, I know that Mississippi State didn't do this, but when Dak was in high school, did his high school wear green and gold? Like was that their colors? Because there was just moments out there where he was out there playing like he thought that they was on his team. Like he just, he just, compl they look so bad in every single way. It was stunning. But I think the thing that made it most stunning is that I think all of us generally believe that this is a good team. And, and I don't think that the people who thought that there was a chance they could go to the Super Bowl were completely out of hand. But we did think, I think a lot of us thought that if that was going to happen, it was probably going to involve San Francisco losing in the first round, uh, not the first round, but in the divisional round. And the reason is, for the Cowboys to do that, they'd have to be at home, where they seem to be a variety of juggernaut playing at home. So they're playing this game against the Packers with a quarterback who hasn't been here at all, with a bunch of receivers who are children, and with what has been a terrible defense. I think I heard uh, Orlovsky on TV today talking about how, uh, I forget who the first person was, but I know the other one was Tommy DeVito, was the uh, NFC Player of the Week after playing against the Green Bay Packers. Nope, nope, nope. Apparently they were out there running the 4-4-4 defense. 12 dudes out there. Dallas couldn't get nothing. First half, um... It's bad where the announcers are out there like, yo, Dak and C.D. Lamb, they seem to have bad vibes. Vibes, man. Vibes. They were talking about vibes. They was over there trying to talk to each other on the sideline because the vibes was bad, right? And not only was the vibes bad, they were so bad to the point, and Sean, I think you probably peeped this, where they were just like, fine, we're just going to throw the ball to C.D. every single time. You notice that happening? Yeah, they came back from the locker room in the second half and were just like, okay, well, let's just feed this guy as much as we can because I guess, you know, to, to combat the bad vibes. Uh, Mina said this the week before the game, and, you know, a credit to Mina, but she said the Cowboys um, love to throw and Dak loves to throw in the middle of the field and the Packers have the worst middle-of-the-field defense, which 
I guess this Sunday looked like the exact opposite, which is crazy to think. They just beat them boys. Silly, silly. And you know that, like, once that happens, man, it ain't nothing but jokes, dog. Like, like all anybody has at that point to ride us through the rest of the scenario is jokes because these are the cowboys and it's jokes. I have heard wild takes on television. I have seen wild takes on the internet about what exactly it is that the cowboys need to do, what they need to pull off. But I do have this question and I don't have an answer for it, but I'm very curious what anybody thinks about this, which is how are we supposed to evaluate how good Dak Prescott is? Because I don't think that they lost this game because of him, right? Like, yeah, he had to pick six, you know, the pick six isn't bad passes. We saw all that, but they got beat so roundly that you can't bring the head coach back. Like it's one of those sorts of situations. There's just no way that you can bring him back. But I didn't come away from this thinking that Dak was the reason that they lost, but certainly I came away from it, you know, knowing that Dak was certainly not the reason that they won. This seemed right? like the first regular season where Dak was playing so well that any doubts of him in the playoffs were kind of getting pushed aside. Yeah, but I think I saw I saw enough of those tough road games where it looked the same as it had been looking that I couldn't I couldn't go that far. And I've seen, like, it's not as though we've never seen Dak Prescott play well in the postseason. That's not true. You can discount the game against Tampa last year because Tampa was not good. But his first playoff game where he started slow against the Packers, but Aaron Rodgers had to do some, like, amazing Aaron Rodgers things for them to beat uh, the Cowboys in that game. But, like, Dak, I've seen the dude be good. But the question I always have about Dak, and I know – I've seen this point made about different people where it's just like where you get drafted affects how much patience you get and everything else. And you never really shake the label of where it is that you are drafted. And that's true. But I don't think that I don't think that's as nearly as lazy a thing as people make it out to be. It kind of depends on who you are and it kind of depends on where you were drafted. So Brock Purdy, I think, is a great example in this where Brock Purdy is taken in the seventh round. And so, yeah, we're going to make Brock Purdy do a lot more before we just stand out here and say, oh, that guy could actually do it. Now, I would make the argument that the solution to this is not to get ahead of yourselves in anointing somebody like Brock Purdy as much as it is taking a little more time and being more skeptical of, say, the Jared Goffs and Carson Wentz's of the world who got anointed after year two largely because they were taken one and two in that draft. But we have seen people where it don't come together for whatever reason, for however much time it takes. Like Trevor Lawrence, we got reasons to have questions about him, but people are going to have fewer questions because he was the number one overall pick and he showed something in year two. And so people had their confirmation that they needed. And then you work the rest out from there. The question I've always had about Prescott, and I've asked people this, and nobody has ever given me a great answer for it. And my question is this, and I understand, I'm going to say this before I get started, this is going to lead to a somewhat convoluted path to getting us back to present day, but it's still a fair question to ask. No one has ever been able to explain to me why it is that that dude was a, was a fourth round pick. I don't get this. Um, the Southeastern Conference is not necessarily the conference that has historically produced the most quarterbacks, but he was a two-time first-team All-SEC player. For goodness sakes, he got Mississippi State to the Orange Bowl. Do you realize how absurd it is that that dude got Mississippi State to the Orange Bowl? I was in Miami living there at the time, and I'm at the Fountain Blue having breakfast, and I look up, and I see people with Mississippi State gear, and I'm going to be honest, I didn't think they would allow them into such a place, let alone the Orange Bowl. But there they were, because Dak Prescott got them there. And so he has NFL size. He has an NFL arm. He processes at an NFL level and beyond. Now, you can make the argument that he was running, you know, Dan Mullen's offense, and maybe that wasn't the best one to prepare you for the NFL. But I feel like by the time 2016 had come around, we had kind of let all these spread guys in. So why exactly is it that Dak Prescott slid to the fourth round? Like, when we ask questions about all the different people and we don't understand how they fell in the draft and everything else, this is the one that jumps out because this is a dude that's a top six or seven quarterback in the NFL who has a legitimate chance to be the MVP this year and has basically looked like a first-round pick since the day he walked in the door. Why was he a fourth-round pick? 
Now, the reason I bring this up now is I'm asking that and wondering if whatever the thing is that made us ask, made him a fourth round pick has something to do with the fact that, you know, I don't want to sound corny, but, you know, when the going get tough, he don't get going. Like, that's what it seemed like. At least, you know, anecdotally, at the very least, watching enough of these playoff games, watching enough of these road games in the regular season against good teams, it seems to happen to the entire team around him. But it also seems to very specifically happen to him. And so where Cam Newton was talking about the difference between game changers and game managers, the game changer is a dude in the midst of all this chaos that looks up and says, hey, 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 hey. It's cool. I'm here. We got this. Let's go. Right. And I'm not saying that the game changer does that in every single scenario. I'm just telling you, I can't think of the scenario where I felt like I saw that from Dak Prescott. Now, maybe there's a measure of confirmation bias that comes into play when I make the you know, when we have this discussion. But I can't figure out exactly how good of a quarterback they have. And that's an issue because I know this much. I may not know how good he is but I know that he is too good for them to think they about to go get somebody else anytime soon. Like I'm talking about what, what, what are the Cowboys going to do? They're going to have to offer Dak a new contract in this offseason to bring his cap number down. Do you think they going to do it? Hell yeah, they going to do it. What the, what the, what the, what the, uh, what the other thing, what the other thing they going to do? Show, show me the guy. Show me the guy. What are they going to do? What are they going to do? They going to try to find a way to get uh, Kirk Cousins coming off an Achilles surgery. Is that what they going to do? What the hell are they going to do? What you going to do? What you going to go get Justin Fields? You going to find a way to, to bring him in there? What you going to do? Go up in the draft? Try to see if you can get Drake May or Jaden Daniels or one of them? What else are you going to do? He going to be their quarterback for a long time. And I know this because speaking of Kirk Cousins, that dude has made something like $750 million. All because you just can't. Kirk Cousins ain't growing on trees. Kirk Cousins, they don't grow those on trees those they don't let the giants tell it they don't grow daniel jones's on trees you know what i'm saying like like no this is this is the guy the cowboys gonna have to have and yeah maybe they gonna have to spend more money than they want to and if you make the argument that maybe they'd be better off moving off such a quarterback getting to a lower cap number and going from there i mean the lions would be an example of this though they were doing this from a different position because they could afford to chalk up a couple of years while they got this thing going so maybe that's different right problem is jerry jones ain't Okay, I don't want to say he doesn't have a couple of years because I feel like that's unfairly pessimistic. He is not promised another couple of years, which makes him just like the rest of us. However, the rest of us ain't this old. Here's Jerry. In terms of playoff losses, where does this one rank for you? Well, I don't have, uh, uh, really, I can't reach back and look at a playoff loss, uh, uh, but this uh, seems like the, uh, the, the most uh, painful uh, because uh, we all had such great expectation and we had hope for this team and uh, uh, thought that we were aligned in a great shape, in great shape, and uh, uh, it didn't happen for us. And it's as fresh on me right now as it is on anybody else. But I don't, uh, I won't get into uh, any uh, of the uh, addressing of any aspects of any part of it. From uh, the coaching to the players to what's around the corner, uh, uh, on a personal basis, I'm, I'm floored. And so, uh, uh, not that there's any world smallest valley and for me being floored. I get that. I understand that. And uh, I know where the responsibility starts and ends. And I've got that real clear, and I know that. But that's not the point. The point is that uh, uh, I'm uh, uh, disappointed for everybody. Look, man, he ain't he ain't got time to start this over and then start this thing back up. He just doesn't. That's not that's not his concept of the world that we in right now. He does not have time to start this over and then start this thing back up. That's not that's not going. He's like Dak gonna be their dude no matter how this goes. I don't I don't know how they figure it out. I don't know what exactly it is that they're supposed to do. But I do know this team is good. 
Like, I saw enough from them to say that this team is good. This team has really, really, really talented players. And they got really talented players at important positions. Edge rusher, got that. I'll put it to you like this. I ain't even got to go through all of them. I can say edge rusher, got that. Wide receiver, got that. Think about this. They lost their all-pro corner this year and rolled up another all-pro corner. They did that. That happened. Deron Bland just rolled up. Uh, Trayvon Diggs out. Deron Bland right in. They just rolled it. They got all of it, except they, they, I mean, you know, I don't like to call people losers. But I cannot reject the hypothesis on its face. Again, not saying they're losers. But I cannot just toss this out of there on its face it, it 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 there's an argument to be made that the problem is they got a bunch of losers and I don't know how you smoke out the losers I don't I don't I don't none of them just look like losers I don't see a like an express specific loser that is on that team um but I will say this Nobody takes up the oxygen quite like the Cowboys because what story really should be coming out of this, and I'm look, I'm guilty of the thing I'm talking about, but if there's a story I feel like we should talk more about coming out of this is, and I talked about it a little bit, it's Jordan Love, man. The Packers have had a good quarterback for 30 years in a row. I want you to think about that for a second. For 30 years in a row, they have had a good quarterback, and it looked like they got another one. And, I mean, that being said, did it look like they got another one? Or did they just get to play the Cowboys? All right, now, um, I'm going to get off the Cowboys a bit, somewhat tangential. Um, I kept seeing on the internet, Sean, I imagine you saw the same thing that everybody talking about uh, the Cowboys are going to hire Bill Belichick, though I imagine that must be news to you because you want that narcotic, and they talking about Bill Belichick going to coach the Falcons. Yeah, I'm trying to block out all the noise. I, I just I don't want Bill Belichick going anywhere. It just seems like a bad move everywhere. All right, I'm going to start with you first here and say that Bill Belichick for the Falcons is a terrible idea, and the reason is very simple. What you got to be in Atlanta is interesting. Right, And what Bill Belichick is going to do is try to make everybody as uninteresting as possible. That is the Patriot way, and that is honestly just not compatible um, to Atlanta. I just don't, I don't, no, 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 I don't see it. I don't see it. Um, I also don't see Bill Belichick for the Cowboys. I'm going to be honest with you. I don't see it for Bill Belichick with any team in the NFL as it stands presently. Now, for the Cowboys... I, everybody's going straight to the Bill Belichick line, and I guess maybe it's just because people have already assumed that Harbaugh, uh, Jim Harbaugh, is going to coach the Chargers. But um, if the Cowboys do fire Mike McCarthy, Harbaugh's the guy that I go for. And the reason that Harbaugh is the guy that I go for is pretty simple. We all understand this dude's a bit of a weirdo. Okay, we get this. We also understand the fact that he burns people out pretty quick. Your best bet is that you'll have Harbaugh for three, maybe four years until the decision is made that you need some sort of change. Okay, what we just say about Jerry Jones. I mean, you can sign a three-year contract with him if you want to. Who knows if it's going to be for three? You know what I'm saying? So, uh... You, you put Harbaugh there with Jerry, I don't think the fact that the burnout thing is going to happen becomes such a big deal. Um, if Harbaugh as a pro coach is anything like Harbaugh as a college coach, you're not really going to get into too many problems with the idea of the front office running things, I don't think. Because I get the feeling that Jim Harbaugh will coach anybody you give him. You guys go out there and bring me players. I'll coach the players that you have. Okay, cool. Um, Dak Prescott... If Jim Harbaugh could figure out how to get it done with Alex Smith in 2011, I feel pretty confident he can figure out what to do with Dak Prescott. And you'll probably get the best version of Dak Prescott um, that you're going to have. If the issue with your team appears to be mental fortitude, which seems to be a big part of what the problem is with the Cowboys, Harbaugh, again, seems like the guy that would be the one to come in and fix this. Like they don't, They're not a team that needs an overhaul so much. They need to get in there with a clear philosophy of toughness and fortitude. And I saw Jim Harbaugh install that at Stanford. 
Stanford. And you may not think that winning a national championship in Michigan is that impressive, but I understand the landscape has changed in a lot of ways for a lot of reasons. I just want to point out that that is the first full-on national championship that Michigan has won since the war in Korea. All right. Throwing all this out there for you. Harbaugh makes a lot more sense to me for the Cowboys for all of those reasons. Now, I know that Belichick did that press conference where he came out and he said that he didn't need to run the front office. He would just want to be a coach in Green Bay if that's the role. I mean, I in Green Bay in New England. If that was just the role that he was going to have as the coach, then he would be willing to just work as the coach. And I know that he was up there like saying that, but y'all don't like Sean, you don't believe that, do you? Absolutely not. Okay, just 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 check it. Like maybe Bill Belichick doesn't want to be the general manager anymore. I have no idea, right? But no, I don't. I think that Bill Belichick would run, want to run personnel, and that's what makes this kind of wild to me. Is I feel like people think that Belichick doesn't care about personnel. He'll just and if he doesn't care about running the personnel, then that means that he would have to go look at a roster and identify the one that he wants. And I would be curious to know what sort of roster Bill Belichick would look at and feel like it's the one that he wants. Because if we've seen anything about Bill Belichick from the last three years, he don't like good players. I mean, I mean, he, he, he had the opportunity to get all those players that he had in New England. He the one that made the decisions on them. And everyone that he picked. He basically had a choice. I could get this guy or I could get somebody good. And every time he took the guy that wasn't good, like he, he full on got the guy that wasn't good. Like if you showed him the roster of the Cowboys, does that really look like what he wants to do? Or does like, does he insist, does he have to play Oregon Trail as the farmer, right? Does he not have it in him to play as the banker? Does he have to play as the farmer? Is that just the way he does it? I don't know. That just might be it. But nothing about the situation with the Cowboys seems to work. And it's for the same thing that I just said about Atlanta. You think Jerry wants a coach that is just wholly and totally uninteresting, but uninteresting in a way that actually, like, commands attention? It doesn't fit. It doesn't fit at all. It doesn't seem to fit to me at all that Belichick would want to deal with all the badgering that you know is going to come from Jerry and Stephen Jones because they run the thing. They enjoy running the thing. Jerry, Jerry... I think this is an important distinction. Now, Sean, you know this about me. You've been over to my house. I do the vinyl thing, right? Like, I'm into the vinyl. But I don't collect vinyl. Any Interesting. Any piece of vinyl I have. Yeah, any piece of vinyl I have, I got it to play it. I don't get vinyl to say that I have it. I'm not into collecting. That's why I gave away, like, hundreds of pairs of shoes because I realized, man, I was collecting. I don't collect. Collecting is wasteful. I get things to use them. I get things to have them in a functional sense. Otherwise, somebody could put them into a better place. I am not an imperialist. Now, is Jerry Jones an imperialist? Duh, of course he is. But he didn't get this team to collect it. He got it to play with it. He got it because he wanted to do things with it. Like that's He has a reasonable amount of expertise. And hey, he's put together a pretty good team, a pretty good roster, all of those things. But Jerry, Ro Jerry Jones has that team because he wants to do something with it. And Bill Belichick, I can't imagine him at all enjoying a life where he's got this dude over his shoulder in that way. And everybody's like, hey, Bill Belichick, he wants to get out here. Bill Belichick wants to coach. I'm telling you right now, these next couple of weeks might be the best in Bill Belichick's life. He might be so relaxed and so chill, he may never come back. I don't know. I'm just telling you. I don't see a situation where it's a good idea to have him. And here's a big part of why. The way that he kicked it only works if you win and you win a lot. And here's how I know this. They won that Super Bowl in 2001. They did not go to the Super Bowl in 2002. Before the first game of 2003, Belichick released Lawyer Malloy. You know, they're all pro safety. he had been a pillar of the team, all that stuff. Belichick got him out of there, and everybody named Mama got out there and was like, I don't know if this guy can run this team. I don't know, you know, because of the way he does things, da-da-da. This is after he had already won a Super Bowl, and cutting Lloyd to Malloy was really driving people to the brink. As I recall, they played their first game that season against the Buffalo Bills. Buffalo beat them 31 to nothing. Of course, from then on, from then until the end of the following season, the Patriots were a full-on juggernaut. But I'm just telling you, it only works if Juggernaut is there. If Juggernaut is an option. It's the only way the Belichick way works, right? It's why all these guys that try to coach like him, it don't work nowhere else because they can't get to the winning part fast enough to where this thing will work. 
right? All those guys who coached under Bobby Knight, other than Mike Krzyzewski, none of them could figure it out because you can only do this if you really win a lot of stuff. It's the only way that it can go. And so who of these jobs that are available is this really going to fit? I just don't see it. Like Arthur Blank, the idea that Arthur Blank wants to hire him because Arthur Blank, again, you know, he ain't got ain't, ain't but so many more days. The Home Depot going to be open, right? Here's the thing, though, for Blank. Um, this ain't going to be no quick turnaround if you bring in Bill Belichick. I just don't see it. I just don't see it being fast. Like, do you think that Tom Landry, when he got fired, and I'm curious about this. I have no idea. When Tom Landry got fired by the Cowboys, I wonder if he was like, well, I can just go find somewhere else. It was Tom Landry. You think Tom Landry forgot how to coach when it was over? You think John Shula, I mean Don Shula forgot how to coach after his last job? Like, we got all these guys, and we all swear they're all football coaches. They don't have anything else to do. Chuck Knoll didn't do anything after he left the Steelers. Uh, Bill Cowher got on television. He ain't gone anywhere else. Like, actually, quite often, dudes in this position get to the end, and it's just the end. I don't know what pleases this dude, but I'm just telling you now. It ain't a whole lot of happy left for him in the NFL because he's going to be a whole lot of miserable to whoever the hell gets him because that's just how he gets down. Right fast, before we go, I want to send a shout out to you, Gerard Mayo. Good luck, brother. Um, I actually meant to like not say brother because people were going to think that when I said brother that I'm saying that in the sense of like, you know, African-American solidarity. So you need to think about it like, good luck, brother. You know, like think about it more like that kind of brother. But then if I say it like that, then you're going to think I'm making an intimation toward that thing Hulk Hogan did that one time that kind of ruined him in the eyes of other people. I can't figure out exactly how it is to address this just so people understand that this would be a very difficult job for anybody and them mean, mean people who they mean to their own people too up there. So again, I don't want you to necessarily assume I'm saying it's just about Gerard Mayo and, you know, what color paint he got. I am just going to tell you this. Before Bill Belichick, the Patriots had a coach that went 10 and 6, 9 and 7, 8 and 8, and they fired him after the 8 and 8. And that coach's name was Pete Carroll. Pete Carroll. And, and uh, what's his name? Uh, Bob Kraft is not young. Now look, man. Maybe it'll help him out. Bob Kraft been out here hanging out with Meek Mill, Jay-Z and them. You know what I'm saying? Maybe they're going to be in Bob's ear making sure he do something fair. I don't know. I just know this. Dog, you just took on the hardest job I could possibly imagine. Coaching what appears to be a lot of bums. Now, people tell me on defense they don't have a lot of bums, and I guess not. Maybe they don't. Maybe they got some good defensive players. Can they play two ways? They got they got the Travis Hunters out there in the crew. Because they, they need to figure that out. Because, brother, I don't know how they're going to score any points. And let me tell you something. They ain't going to have a sense of humor about it for long. Prize Picks is the most fun you can have by winning up to 25 times your money this football season. And now you can play during basketball season, too. You just select two or more players, pick more or less on their projected stats, and place your entry. And with the NBA back, you can now pick combo projections across football and basketball from the Specials League, a league created specifically for combo projections that includes two or more players from different sports or leagues. Prize Picks is really simple to play. You can make your picks and submit your entry in less than 60 seconds. And if you stick around for the end of the show, you'll get to hear some picks from our producer, Sean, that can either help you win or make you feel miserably. So make sure you go to prizepicks.com slash Bomani and use code Bomani for a first deposit match up to $100. That's prizepicks.com slash Bomani. Prize Picks, daily fantasy sports made easy. We know you can't be on top of all the news and information of the day. No need for the social media feeds. We got you. Now, if you haven't heard. Guys, guys, we're going to we're going to get to if you haven't heard in just a second. I want to, you know, for those of you who go back with me, you know, I'd ordinarily like to do a little something uh, for the King holiday. Uh, just, you know, just offer some words or whatever. But I, to a degree, felt like I was saying the same thing every year. And I thought the message I needed to say every year was roughly the same. But I was saying the same thing every year. And then I felt like I needed to fall back. And um, and then I looked up and I saw that Pat McAfee had something to say about uh, Martin Luther King Day, and I got to be honest, that made me judge myself a little bit, right? Like, McAfee has something to say about Martin Luther King Day, 
and I didn't have something to say about Martin Luther King Day. And, uh, you know, that's when that's when people start asking you questions. Right. They start using words like trustee. Right. And I was like, Ugh, I don't know. They start saying stuff like company, man. I'll put that back up there, Sean. Put that back up there. Put that back up there. Um, I want to read this for the people. What uh, the quote that's been offered here that McAfee had to say. And I'm just going to offer this without just he had a dream. And I think Lank was one of the closest we've had to potentially that dream coming to fruition. Sean, do I want to read any more after that? Do I want to, do I want to keep going after that? Do I think I, that's enough there. I'll just say it started with that and it ended with all we need is a little bit of love and. Whew. Yes. Sean, I told you the naysayer thing was going to get out of hand, didn't I? Didn't I tell you we need to bring this under control? It has certainly snowballed. Um, the chat is uh, reacting just as you reacted during the ad break. Yes, and I just need to just say this right fast. I don't care what Pat McAfee or Jonathan Majors or anybody else got to say to you. Martin Luther King is the finest man that this country has ever produced. A real, live, incorruptible revolutionary where the basis of the revolution was 100% love. And the belief, so could Carl Michael, said something very interesting right after Martin Luther King died, where he said the real tragedy of this was, was that Martin Luther King was the only person in this country who saw enough good in white people to believe that they could actually be truly good enough to be fair to everybody in this country. No matter what you think or what you say about King, the true basis of him was his belief in the goodness of white people, not what is bad about white people. And the reason I bring that point up now, why it becomes very, very important to me, is that anytime you say something that's challenging of how white people get down in the short term, people assume that what you're saying is that white people are terrible and that they naturally racist. When in reality, if people thought that white people was naturally racist, then they would never argue about any of this stuff. We just pack all our shit and go somewhere else. But that's actually not what most people think who ask for this or most people think who push for more. It is the belief that we as a society in total are in fact capable of better and that white people themselves are in fact capable of better. And if there was a measure of awareness of how they was getting down and treating people in this country, that they wouldn't keep on doing that. And that's the, the true legacy of King is that King believed in the goodness of America and in goodness of the American. And in believing in the goodness of the American, got shot. Again, not because he believed the best, I mean the worst. Damn, I had that perfect, I'm gonna do that again. Again, not because he believed the worst, but because he believed the best. Think about how sad that is. Anyway, what's up on the, if you hadn't heard? Uh, quite the tough transition, Bo, but I got a, I, I got a, I know, I, I know, I know, baby. I know we made it happen though. I'm going to teach you this trick. Don't point out how tough the transition is. Just make the goddamn transition. Well, that's what, <laughs> what I had to tell you about this story. One time my daddy tells this story about how somehow he and some friends were having a conversation about how ugly some people can be. Cause you know, some people are ugly. We don't talk about that so much in our modern society. I don't talk about ugly as much as we used to. We used to talk about ugly all the time, but he's talking about how somebody could just be so ugly, just be so ugly, just be so ugly. And I'm going to throw a random name out here. And he's just talking about how this famous person named, um, Jill Jackson, how ugly Jill Jackson was. He just kept going how ugly Jill Jackson was. And he noticed it got real awkward and he couldn't figure out why it got quiet. He's like, yo, what's going on? And the man uh, with the, the couple they was hanging with was like, people always tell my wife how much she looked like Jill Jackson. And I always asked my dad what he did in that moment. And he was like, well, yeah, I just started talking about something else. He was like, we ain't need to wallow in it. We just, you just, when it's time to make a transition, you just make a transition. All of that's to say, Sean, what's the next topic on If You Haven't Heard? Well, Bo, here's a clip on the NRA. Hi, my name is Stephen Gutowski. I'm a firearms policy reporter, CNN contributor, and the founder of TheReload.com. I recently wrote a story about the shocking resignation of Wayne LaPierre. The 74-year-old had spent decades at the top of the National Rifle Association and built it into one of the most powerful lobbying groups in the country. But on the eve of a corruption trial in New York, LaPierre decided to step down. He cited health concerns as part of the reason for his decision, but it's important to note that the corruption trial centers in large part on the accusation LaPierre 
diverted millions of dollars of NRA funds towards lavish personal expenses, things including private jet flights, luxury hotel stays, and overseas trips, as well as cozy relationships with many of the NRA's vendors. LaPierre's resignation may help the NRA's defense in court, but with LaPierre's allies still in control of the NRA and little sign its legal strategy is shifting, it may still ultimately be up to a New York judge and jury on what the future of the nation's largest gun rights group will look like. I have to say, Sean, I misinterpreted the awkwardness of the transition and now understand a little bit better why you felt the need to point it out. My bad. (laughs) (laughs) I I was, you know, I was going to let you do your whole spiel, but I was like, this is the next one we have ready to go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What you said up next is the NRA. I was like, oh, oh, that's what he meant. My fault. My fault. (laughs) Um. You know what? Let's just go to the next one. (laughs) All right, we got a clip on uh, nanoplastics in our water. Hi, my name is Corinne Pertell, and I'm a science and medicine reporter for the Los Angeles Times. We know that plastic residues are everywhere in our world, in the snows of Antarctica, on the depths of the ocean floor. Even newborn babies excrete microscopic bits of plastic in their very first bowel movements. With my colleague Suzanne Rust, I wrote recently about new research out of Columbia University that finds plastic particles in yet another unexpected place, bottle drinking water. Using sophisticated imaging technology, scientists at Columbia's Lamont Doherty Laboratory examined samples from three popular water brands widely available in the U.S., and I'm sorry, but they won't tell us which ones. They found hundreds of thousands of bits of plastic per liter of water. 90% of those were small enough to qualify as nanoplastics, microscopic flecks so small that they can be absorbed into human cells and tissues and cross the blood-brain barrier. The researchers tested the particles for seven known types of plastic. The most common type they found were polyamides, a form of nylon used in the reverse osmosis filters at water bottling plants. Unsurprisingly, they also found polyethylene terephthalate, or PET, the kind of plastic used to make disposable water bottles. But the researchers found that only 10% of the nanoparticles analyzed could be classified as one of those seven known plastics. As for the rest of them, we don't know what they are. We also don't know the full picture of what nanoplastics do to our health or the long-term risks of exposure. What we do know is that plastic isn't just around us anymore. It's in us, too. Yo, I have got to say, Sean, how old were you? Uh when you realized that plastic was such an issue? Uh, like, I, I, when I chose to believe it, probably not that long ago. Like, I just, I mean, I had never considered, like, the idea as a kid, like, wait, this plastic, like, it never go, it never disintegrates in any sort of way whatsoever. It never goes, it's, it's here forever. Like, yo, we really got to, I ain't gonna lie. I got to do a much better job of my recycling plastics. Anyway, I thought that was enough of a thought. And now we just out here drinking all this. Pl- like we, we go turn into plastic. Yeah, this is one of the stories where I was like, you know, maybe I shouldn't have played this for the audience. It's better to not know some things than know them, you know? Yeah, because we go keep on drinking it. Right? Like we're not, we're not going to. Oh, boy. I got I to gotta start making, if you hadn't heard, a little bit more feel good. Like I, I need to do that because I'm, I'm like, I'm, 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 I'm listening to that while reading the words. He had a drink, he had a dream, and I think Lank is the closest. Wow, wow, we got anything else? This is a tough block for the viewers on a on a very special day, but we got one on friend groups. This is the last one for if you haven't. Did you just say on a very special day? <laughs> we just turned it into an after school special. It's a very <laughs> special episode of the right time. Hi, Have a I'm dream, Jeff folks. Weiss, and I'm a digital culture reporter at Business Insider. Uh, I wrote a story last week on a discourse I'd seen across TikTok where creators have been sort of debunking the value and healthiness of large friend groups. So I think it can often be thought that having a large group is a social ideal or means you're sort of a well-adjusted person, but people on TikTok have really been pushing back on that notion in recent weeks. We'd interviewed a creator named Ashley Corbo, who's 26, who went viral for a TikTok saying she was the worst version of herself when she had the most friends. And in her opinion, that the most authentic people have fewer and sort of scattered friendships. 
So Ashley had recently gone through a friendship breakup from a large group where she wasn't treated well, she said, and sort of felt unable to assert herself. And her argument was that groups can sort of foster a mob mentality. And she initially assumed that she was in the wrong, but she's sort of now come around to feeling like having less friends is just healthier and preferable and that one-on-one friendships uh, foster deeper connections and more diversity of thought. So it's a sentiment that resonated with a lot of people and other creators have also tackled the subject in in highly viewed TikToks, but um, some disagree, some counter. They say that sort of America has a loneliness and isolation problem and interdependence and community are are really good for us. So uh, it's been an interesting debate. Yeah, so, like, I heard this, and my thought about it was in the context of, like, being part of big friend groups, because I don't really do groups so much like that. Like, I feel like I'm an auxiliary member of, a, I feel kind of like Neil Young, kind of in Crazy Horse, kind of in CSNY, you know what I mean? Like, I come in, I can come in and jump in a few different groups or whatever, everybody be happy to see me, you know, at least I feel like they're happy to see me, but I'm not, like, I don't have that many big groups that we have, but the idea To me, it's less about the number, at least I would think in theory, less about the number of friends you have than like the substance of the relationships that you have then subsequently with said friends and like what you make out of it. So yeah, we definitely have a loneliness problem, but the solution to the loneliness is not necessarily a big old group. There's a lot of people that are in big old families that still manage to feel lonely within that. It's about the substance of what the relationships are. But so I don't think less friends or more friends is necessarily positive or negative. I would think, though, that more friendship, regardless of how you put it together, but more friendship, that would be intrinsically positive. Yeah, I think there's certain levels of tiers to friendships, and I I, I would want more really strong tier one friends that I can count on and can talk about anything with versus the outside large friend group just to do some social engagement kind of vibe yeah yeah we don't need none of that we don't need none of that all right Bo. today's prompt was uh worst jobs you've ever had and uh got a lot of good submissions from your uh right time followers so here's the first one we got What's up? This is Chris, long-time listener, first-time caller. And I'm calling regarding the worst job I ever had. I was 14, and I got a job selling newspapers for the Contra Costa Times. Now, how it worked, I was actually living in a hotel at the time with my, my family. And this lady would come pick me, me up along with a few other people. And... We drive from Vallejo, California, all the way to, like, Pittsburgh area, California, Nixon Bay area. And our job would be to try and get people to subscribe to the newspaper. And here I am thinking, you know, 14 years old, first looking at the job, thinking I'm going to be able to make some, coin, make some coin to be able to take care of my family. And needless to say, the last day that I had the job, I was like, hey, so I've been working for at least a couple of months and I've got nothing. You know, my mom's asking, when am I going to get paid? AKA, oh, y'all don't get paid in actual money. We pay you in these entertainment coupon books. And so she gave me this entertainment coupon book and it said, so pick you up tomorrow. Same time. I'm like, uh, no, I quit. Thank you very much, Bonnie. Appreciate it. Peace out. They paid you with the Gold C coupon book? Sean, you know about the Gold C coupon book? I don't, but it sounds not ideal. Like back, back when I was a kid, I thought you sold the Gold C coupon book to get money. I ain't know nothing about the idea that you was working for... Whoo, whoo, whoo. Yeah, whoo, boy, my daddy would have shown up there with an attitude. Whew, what else we got? Hi, Bomani. This is Jasmine from Tallahassee. The worst job I ever had. I was about 20 years old, I think, 20 or 21. I started working for Department of Corrections. And I got there, and I was about two or three months in. And the job was fine. It was going fine. <laughs> we go on the yard to have them line back up to count them to put them back in their dorm room. And there's this one guy. 
I'm not going to say what type of guy he was, but he's the kind of guy who got stuffed in lockers as a child. Um, and he's yelling at these grown men. And I looked at my coworker who was next to me, and I said, this motherfucker's going to get us all killed. And I quit like a month later because I didn't get paid enough for that shit. Like the people, like the inmates weren't the problem. It was these ignorant motherfuckers that was going to get me stabbed, and I wasn't with that. Appreciate it, Bamani. So, just so I have this right, she's referring to her coworker? Yeah, I believe so. Getting into an argument with yeah. one of the people that she's correcting. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, no, no, no. You can't be out here froggy. No, no, no. Yo, I love the full-on passion she has about this, by the way. Also, I got some, Jasmine ain't no joke. Cause Jasmine's like, it wasn't so bad at first. She's like, yeah, job's a job, right? Wow, really? She must have hit the point of no return there. All right, our last one, Bo, is a little longer, but the storytelling here is uh, quite, quite wonderful. Lego. Hey, Bo, this is Quares from New Orleans. Sophomore year college, hey. and I passed up this cushy little internship at the rental car company, making seven dollars an hour for a job as a meter reader with the local utility company, making thirteen dollars an hour plus mileage. Now, on the first day, they did the smart thing and sent me out with this vet who knew the route backwards and forwards. When I asked him this one question, he pretty much told me everything a reasonable person would need to know to head in the opposite direction. I said, look, man, we're going in people's backyards, under people's houses, and alleys, behind buildings. Now, what do you do when you come across dogs? Man, he looked me dead in my eyes with zero play in his voice and said, look, you see that handheld computer where we take these readings? Go outside that dog head and break out as quickly as you can. No safety training, no online videos, no OSHA manual. Just go outside that dog's head. But I kept showing up. So finally, I got there on my own. And, man, that 8 to 12 thing was out the door. Between locating all the meters, lock gates, ducking and dodging dogs, and vermin of all sorts, the weather. And, look, man, life was no crystal step. You had the people, man. And I'm telling you, it don't matter if you were in the city, the suburbs, the hood, the trailer park. Man, it is something about that guy with the gray shirt on to calculate your next high-ass electric bill that put everybody in a bad mood. And I was able to make it for about eight weeks. And then I, I got this new route. So I walk up to this house, man, and it's like an oasis sitting on acres and acres. It's surrounded by a fence, but there's no gate. So I'm already jaded. So I walk in, I proceed with caution. So I walk in, man, there's dogs frolicking, birds chirping, but something fell off. So I'm walking. I get about 100 yards, and the house is still off a ways. So I pull out my scope to see if I can catch the reading from a distance. And I'm looking, and all of a sudden, my view goes dark. Man, I put my scope down, and sitting right in front of me is a peacock. Now, you might think I'm tripping because all you know is those cute, docile creatures, you know, prancing around the zoo. But I'm telling you, man, after eight weeks, man, that peacock was like Godzilla to me. Now, I read back and made a motion to me. And all I know is I wasn't about to find out what this, what this peacock was about to do next. So I get back, man. I tell my manager, look, man, I've been chased. I've been bitten. I've been harassed. This New Orleans is 100 degrees in the shade, man. I've been barbecued. I thought it did something looking like I'll be sure, and I'm heading back to college looking like Wesley Snipes. And now I've been chased by a damn peacock. I'm out. Bo, love the show, man. Bring back some of them classics, man, about the time you tested your father. I got stories for days. Peace. Uh, to quote our man Ego Bruised in the chat room, folks from New Orleans know how to tell a story. Sean, you ever spent a lot of time with, uh, with, with the Wotis, New Orleans folks? I have not, but I did enjoy my experience in New Orleans, and I can, I can, I can guarantee that they do know how to tell a story. They are the best and the worst all at one time. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us here on... Oh, wait a minute. I got ahead of myself. Sean, prize picks. Get the people some advice. We got two games on Monday night, and by the time this pod comes out, you guys will be ready for the bets for the for the late game. Eagles, Tampa Bay. Give me Baker Mayfield, third, 236 and a half pass yards. I'll take more. Quez Watkins, 15 and a half receiving yards. I'll take more because A.J. Brown will not be there. Rashad White, 0.5 Russian reception touchdowns. I'll take more. And Jake Elliott will hit more than two field goals. That's what I got for prize picks, Bo.
All right, there we go. And ladies and gentlemen, thanks so much for joining us here on The Right Time, a Wave Sports and Entertainment original presented by Prize Picks. My man, Sean, you handling everything behind the scenes. Thank you, sir. Also, thanks to our If You Haven't Heard contributors. Thanks to Steven Gatowski. Check out his story on the NRA Under Siege at theatlantic.com. Thanks to Kareem Pertil. Check out her story for the LA Times on uh, nanoplastic bits in bottles of drinking water. And thanks to Jeff Weiss. Check out his story at Business Insider about people online debunking the idea that having a large friend group is healthier. Remember, subscribe, like, follow the right time, rate us, review us, give us five stars. You only give us four stars. I'm inclined to believe you are a hater. And we'll talk to you guys in a couple of days. Take it easy.